I want to hear from the A's. I want to hear from the teenagers now in the room. I want to hear from a couple of teenagers. What was the metaphor or the explanation that, that seemed to work? Yes. Say again. What, how did you explain it? What did you say? I'm sorry, what did he say? Yeah. yeah. He said it's like a family. It's like yeah. A family. Yeah. Great. And with mom and dad and the kids and so forth. Great. What else? Here. Yeah. A school. A school. A school. Uh huh. What did she say? Uh, she said, uh, imagine you are in a group in the school and uh, it's about uh, growing and developing. Great. Cool. What else? A coach and a soccer team. Ah, soccer team coach. <laughs> Fabulous. Great. What's another one over here? One in the back. You had your hands up back in the back. Yes, Alyssa. <laughs> That's great. All right, what else? Over here, a couple in the middle here. Would you guys talk about football or what? You know? Football, family, anything different? Super. Yes? Doctor. A doctor, wow. But a so, doctor who suge just suggests. Like a naturopath rather than a surgeon, right? Yeah, okay. Cool. So, this is very, very important. And it seems really stupid and silly. One of my clients years ago, when America discovered that we had a nuclear waste problem in the 70s, who, you know, who knew? Um, they created two uh, competing, of course, classic American solution, create two competing locations and groups of scientists and engineers to figure out what are we going to do with this waste that's going to be here for a million years. And one of them was in the state of Washington. It was called BWIP, the Basalt Waste Isolation Project in Hanford, Washington. And it was right near Spokane. And one of my former graduate students was an internal uh, person to that team. And he called me when he said, John, we need help. So I go there. And so in the room, I, I did a two-day workshop. And in the room, there was the executive director who reported to Washington, D.C. So he lived in a political world. Then you have the, the, the heads of various departments and they were caught between the political world and their, so you had engineers, you had scientists, you had construction, you know, people constructing stuff. And they had completely different worldviews. And I said to my friend uh, who brought me in, I said, why, why? what's going on? He said, they, they, they can't communicate. So the first exercise I did was this one. You're on a plane, 15 year old says, be, wh be whip, be whoosh. what is that about? What are you all up to here? And before they even did it, they argued. They said, this is stupid. They turned to the director. Why is this guy here? He doesn't have a PhD in engineering or he doesn't, he's never built anything. Why is he here? And fortunately, the CEO said, let's just give this a try. And so for 10 minutes, I let them try to explain what they were doing. And then out of that, of course, came all these different metaphors. So instead of arguing about their discipline, they were talking about metaphors. Now it was a safer conversation. And out of that, I said, if you were going to pick one metaphor among all of you for what you're trying to do here, and a simple statement, what would it be? And, they, and they, the, the CEO, the, the, uh, the head of the project, and my, and my friend later said that was the most important thing that happened in those two days, was everybody agreeing on the story, it, they call it a narrative these days, about what they were about. How they recommend this, because what you just said is embedded in your reasons for being in OD and the way you frame what you do when you go in. It's, it's that substrata that you never think about. So here we go. OD is the application of action research methodology, applied behavioral science principles, and systems theory to human organisms to increase the internal and external effectiveness of the organization and its members, especially in facilitating change using processes that involve those affected. Now, if I were talking to a teenager, I would say, we help uh, people in organizations uh, Create a life, create an organization that's safe for everybody and that really gets the job done and people can't wait to get to work in the morning. And we work with leaders to help them make that happen. That's what we do. Now, I, I, I might find out. No, I, sorry. That's just what came to me in this moment. It'll be different with somebody else. But these metaphors are the way to go. So whenever I'm talking to a client, I want to use, my, I want to use the client's language. 
So if I'm talking to scientists, I'll use a metaphor that speaks to them. If I'm talking to you know, a football crew, I'll do something else. I've, I've had the Canadian government, I use a different language with them. I was in the Caribbean doing a thing with 12 of the Commonwealth nations, the, the, the permanent secretaries of all the 12 nations in the, in the Caribbean. I, there were three white faces in the room. The completely black audience. I loved it because I always knew where I stood. Now, I've introduced this partly in response to that because I would say something and they'd go, Amen, Amen, Amen. And I knew, I knew when, when we were, you know, in sync, had never had any doubt where I was. You talk to a, a room full of white German Poles, you know, and <laughs> I wonder what's happening. You know, I'm up here thinking, I wonder how it's, what's going. Quick story. The first uh, leadership intensive that I did in Poland was for these Siemens engineers. Three and a half days, deep, deep, I mean deep work. At the end, this guy comes up to me and I said, so how was this for you? And I'm standing with my friend Derek from Poland. And the guy said, Nizhle, Nizhle. And he walked away. And I turned to Derek and said, what, what does Nizhle mean? And he said, not bad. And I said, not bad, jeez. Three and a half days, life-changing stuff. And Derek said, look, John, the guy just told you that you changed his life. <laughs> and I said, well, why didn't he tell me? He said, he did. He told you it was not bad. <laughs> John, this is Poland. It's not California, he said. So, you, you know, so you, we need to calibrate, uh, calibrate what, what we're listening for and calibrate the content so that we can, we can find out what's, what's happening. So, uh, here we go. I'm going to talk very quickly about the big three. Uh, these are the giants that we're talking about, uh, Taylor, Bion, and Kurt Levine. And we'll do some very quick study, and then I'm going to have you, again, do some work with each other. So, whoops, my, my uh, build didn't work there. Before we go to the men, here's a woman, Mary Parker Follett. Very few people have heard of her. Marv Weisbord is the one that really uncovered her work. And she was the one who really began to work on group theory. Ron Lippitt was the one that introduced the group concept to Kurt Levine. Kurt Levine came from, from psychology as his, the, the individual was the focus. And how, how can the individual resist uh, fascism and what does democracy look like and so forth. But it was Ron Lippitt who really, the student, who got Kurt thinking about the group as an entity, as a, as a thing, as another thing. But Mary Parker Follett was the one who sort of named this thing. She, it was her whole thing around uh, conflict resolution was something she explored. This is amazing. Nobody's ever heard of her. Empowerment. She was the one that first used the concept of empowerment and this whole thing about the task of leadership. So Google her. I highly recommend you Google her before you go to the men uh, so we'll see what happens. Thank you, Mary. Bless your heart. I'm not sure I'd want to, like, spend an afternoon with you, <laughs> but, but she's very, very... Yes, yeah, very much, yeah, kind of that, yo, Adrian, yeah, okay, let's run up the steps. So, Frederick Taylor, most people have a negative view of Taylor, Taylorism, stop, you know, stopwatches, efficiency, and so forth. You should read uh, Marv's book uh, called Productive, Productive Workplaces, there's a whole section in about, about Taylor. Uh, Marvin and I have talked a lot about, uh, about him and, and, uh, over the years. He's the father of scientific management, Schmidt the shoveler. So uh, Taylor, in fact, his business card <coughs> said consulting engineer. First one anybody knows about that had that concept. He was a consulting engineer. And he went in and, as, as you'll see in a minute, his intention was to create a more humane world for the workers and to reduce the tension between the workers and the and the managers but so he goes in there's a there's a coal uh, factory and they're trying to become more efficient shoveling coal this is you know we're actually shoveling coal here right it's not it's not automated and so Taylor said find me the best coal shoveler in this organization well it turned out to be a guy called Schmidt that's what he's called in all the in all the literature and so they studied Schmidt what kind of shovel did he use? How many, how many strokes per minute? You know, how, did he rest? What did he do? All these kind of things. And then how can we make other people be like Schmidt? And of course, 
uh, Taylor was the one that figured out that what made Schmidt so, so powerful was he took breaks. So the breaks were a part of the deal. He took rest. He did certain things to, you know, to take care of himself while he was shoveling the coal. This is a really, it's a, it's a fascinating thing. I hope you can get Marv's book. He was the one who introduced matrix management. You know, so that not everybody is, you know, he tried to break down the silos. And he was really into labor management cooperation. So when you get Marv's book, Productive Workplaces, I have it on, on a slide coming up. Uh, read this whole section about these people I'm talking about. It's just fascinating. <clears throat> Wilfred Bion. We had an experience uh, yesterday uh, similar to this. He's the, actually the, uh, one of the key figures in the formation of London's Tavistock Institute. Rafi Park is the, uh, what do you call it, the downstream, the descendant, I guess you'd say. Uh, philosophically, uh, Rafi Park is the, is the descendant of that uh, organization. <clears throat> uh, in a situation where there's ambiguous leadership, like yesterday, we got five people sitting on a stage, not saying anything, looking somewhere else, ignoring us, something else. See, those are all labels we put on five people sitting on the stage, not speaking, looking at the back of the room. Everything else is interpretation. Well, in that kind of ambiguous situation, <clears throat> like a group, like a T group, if you understand T groups, or a TAVI group, which is a similar thing in, in the UK, what do you do? Well, Bion discovered that there, there's four basic uh, ways that people uh, respond to, the, to deal with their anxiety. Of course, there's fight, which is to, you know, go up and do something to the, to the people, have a, like a revolution or something. Uh, a little bit of that yesterday. Flight. Some people said, I'm out of here. This is ridiculous. I don't know why I'm here. What the heck? I've got to go to the bathroom. I've got to go make a phone call or I've got to do something. Uh, the, the third thing is pairing. <clears throat> I'm anxious and I go, Suzanne, let's talk about, I don't care, anything, okay? It doesn't matter. Let's just talk. In fact, Catherine and I were talking about my shoes at one point and I thought, we're pairing now. This is pairing, definitely pairing here to avoid whatever the mess is that's going on. And then, so you can ask which one of these were you involved in. And the fourth one is dependency, like I wish they would do something, like waiting for a leadership to change somehow, to start doing something uh, that, would, that would happen. And then he said there's a fifth option, which is to do the work, which is to start working in the here and now, about the here and now, and to say, hey, I'm really ticked off at you, or whatever, just get back to the here and now. So we made all, all of these were going on yesterday, which that's why I said, ah, oh, we're, we're in a tabby group. <clears throat> He was the one who saw this. This is a fabulous story, and I, I love the way Marv, Marv tells it in his book. <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in the UK, in England, after the war, just in the late 40s, they had these ways of mining, and it was called strip mining, and, and the, the, everybody had a job. So it was, it, was, it, it was Taylorism at its best. Everybody had a job, and they just did their job. Okay, so they didn't get the whole concept of Taylorism. They got the only part about being efficient in this, in this little job. And so at one point, uh, one of his uh, uh, colleagues goes down into the mine and found out that this group of miners on their own, without anybody knowing, had created this team approach to mining, which completely changed the paradigm about how people work. So everybody had, had a completely different role. It was a team responsibility for mining this section and all that. And as, as, uh, as he tells it, he came up out of the mine a changed man. He saw something happening there. It just changed everything. This is this sort of breakthrough team approach. Kurt Levine, he's, he's, he runs in my blood uh, because his first graduate student in America was Ron Lippitt, a young YMCA guy. Uh, and Ron was my mentor. I happened to meet Ron and he, when he was in his uh, 60s, and he became one of, one of, my, one of my key teachers. Uh, you should read The Practical Theorist or The Productive Workplaces by Marv. Those are the two books I highly recommend. Now, I'm going to really go into Kurt Levine because he is the guy for me. It's the Harwood Pajama Factory in 1939, 1947. <coughs> Harwood was a, a relatively uh, new plant making pajamas located in Virginia. And, uh, peop and it, it was uh, people, they were, make they were making pajamas. So some people made sleeves, some people made, you know, tops, bottoms, and then they, it was piecework. You got, you got measured and paid by how many pieces of stuff you created, okay? 
And so uh, things were falling apart, and the owners <clears throat> knew one of the guys, Alex Bavilus, who knew uh, Kurt Levine, one of the grad students. So Kurt and a couple of his young graduate students started working with the, with the, uh, with the pajama factory. <clears throat> and they did something very different, which nowadays we would go, they talked to everybody. They didn't just talk to the plant manager. They didn't just talk to the, 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 the department heads and the team leaders. They also talked to the workers, the frontline workers. Now, you've got to understand, in 1939, this is like, like, what? You did what? Yeah, we talked to the workers. And why? Kurt said, well, because they know, <laughs> they know what's happening. They know what the, where the problems are. They even know where the solutions are. Let's just involve them in the project. And so, as a result, they, they, they and here they are. This is a, an actual picture of them working in there, making these pajamas. It's amazing. If somebody said, John, you have to do that for the rest of your life, I'd say, just shoot me right now and get it over with. Huh? It's not going to happen. So what they did is they created cross-functional um, teams made up of high performers, like the same machines, same uh, fabric. Some people were able to make, like Schmidt the shoveler, they were able to make more pieces. So they said, let's get those people together and do some brainstorming to see if we can figure out what they're doing and why. And so they, and they were allowed to set their own targets. They had nothing to lose. The plant was going down the tube. This is where you get your leverage in OD. Things are going down the tube, they'll go, oh, it, it couldn't hurt. Like the guy in the, in the restaurant in New York City, hears a screech of tires on the street outside Manhattan. He looks out, some guy's just been hit by a truck. He's lying there, dead on a doornail. So the guy jumps up out of his chair, runs out, starts giving him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And everybody says, hey the, hey, the guy's dead. And the guy says, couldn't hurt. <laughs> you you got to, come on, guys. You can, that, isn't that funny? I think it's funny. <laughs> so at some point, when the organization is almost dead, and you come in and say, well, let's try this. Well, it couldn't hurt. I mean, it can't do any more damage than where we are. That was the situation here. So they allowed the workers, instead of assigning targets, they allowed the workers to choose targets. And they chose targets that were higher than any, than any of the supervisors had ever seen before. And they said, oh yeah, we can do that. And so they went from 75 to 87 in five days and sustained it. Then they took a group of average performers and asked them, and they went from 67 to 82. And I mean, you have to read the book to get what the numbers are, but this is staggering. So the whole plant, whoop, just started producing more. And they were self-managing, they were monitoring their own performance and everything. So this is where a lot of this stuff that we take for granted now, this is where it all started. Is this interesting? Are you guys bored or what? I, I, I can't tell sometimes, you know? <clears throat> oh, right. This is like a way, way back in my career, I was doing this leadership thing and there was long table, a man executive at the end, his direct reports down the side, and I'm up here doing my thing, and I'm looking at him, and he's going. <laughs> and I'm going. <laughs> you know. And at a break, I went up to him, my heart's pounding, and I said, Greg, how's this going for you? And he said, John, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me in my life. <laughs> so, so when I look at people going like this, they're thinking really, really hard about what I'm saying. That's my, that's my default now, in, in order to keep talking. Okay, so this is a really important uh, uh, deal here that you all should know about. And these were Lewin's Prince Levine. He was Polish, born in Poland, emigrated to Germany, went to Berlin, taught school there. And in the middle 30s, since they were Jewish, his daughter couldn't go to university. Thank God he emigrated to America, said, I will not live in a country where my daughter cannot go to university. If he'd stayed, we would, he would probably be dead. We would never have any of this. So I just feel grateful beyond words for what he brought to the world. He had a formula that a person's behavior, an individual's behavior, is a function of who the person is interacting with the environment. Now my pop, God bless him, he was an extraordinary man uh, was a newspaper man. I have five generations of Lutheran ministers on my father's side. I'm John Jacob Scherer IV. They came from München. So the circle is, I'm closing the circle here. <laughs> so 
So Jacob came over in 1780, Jacob Scherer, Lutheran minister. All the way down the line, my pop decided to break the chain and be a newspaper man, which in those days meant alcoholic. <laughs> so, pop, so pop was an alcoholic newspaper man, brilliant, wonderful, never met a stranger. I'm standing here in many, many ways, uh, manifesting a lot of his gifts. <laughs> Sorry, didn't know that was there. So thank you, Pop. So he would go off, I got one snap, <laughs> that's good. So Pop would go off every now and then to an alcohol center and he would, you know, get dried up, so to speak, come back into the family. Three weeks later, he's drinking again. Why? The system hadn't changed, okay? They were digging with the individual. They forgot about the E, like in a merger. Forgot about the M. Forgot about the system. When I was starting to do therapy, I didn't realize what I was doing until Virginia Satir, I was a Gestalt train, um, and I started reading Virginia Satir's book called Conjoint Family Therapy. Oh, that's what I'm doing. It just made no sense to me to not have the whole system in the room, which Marv you know, named some years later. I remember this one time, I had a couple, I was doing Back before my divorce, I did a lot of marriage counseling. <clears throat> that usually in Central Europe does not get a laugh. And in Poland, you shake a tree and three Catholics fall out, and they don't think it's funny either. But, <laughs> but there you have it. And so th there was this couple, and, uh, and the, the husband was complaining about their dog. She had this little poodle. And he said, I think she loves the dog more than she loves me. This little, little, you know, <laughs> kind of dog. I found out later. And so I said, next week, bring the dog. <laughs> and I thought, the dog is part of the system. I'm a Gestalt guy. When you name something, it's, you know, it's part, like in a dream. Oh, okay, all right. So the dog came and sat in a, sat in a chair. And I had the husband talk, talk to the dog. <laughs> and then I switched him. You know, the Gestalt, I changed, had the dog in his chair and had him sit in the dog's chair and be the dog. <laughs> and he was going... And I said, so how do you feel about Tom? He said, and he said, yeah, Tom's okay, but I really like Sue. Okay. But, do you, you know, I did this whole dialogue anyway. That was, it, it was really successful. Anyway, I remember the story. So as OD people, this is why training, this is why, oh, God, I'm going to make some people mad here. <clears throat> Any training driven by a calendar is ineffective in the system. If somebody is sitting in your training program or coaching program because it showed up on a calendar and training or HR or somebody, operations said, it's your day to go to the thing on conflict resolution, it's pure chance. If what you learn, it will probably help you individually, but the chances of it actually happening in the system are very, very small. But if you're in that room because you're facing a conflict that's killing you and you've chosen to hey, I need some help in conflict resolution, and you're in a room with some other people, or even better, with the people you have the conflict with, now we're talking. Same training, but real people working on real issues in real time. Now we're starting to impact the system. And Kurt knew this. You got to work on a, you, you got to, I mean, he didn't come up with real people, real issues, real time, but that's what that's about. Second principle, no research without action, no action without research. Most, many people in our field, they go in, they've got a package, they listen to the client just long enough to know that their package is what's needed, and they go do it. You know, like when, a, when you teach a child to use a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Another principle is we tend to see what we know how to fix. I, I did the pinch theory, you know, with Jack Sherwood years ago, and everywhere I went, gosh, you know what they need? They need the pinch theory. Isn't that amazing? Then I learned, you know, breakthrough thinking. And then I, everywhere I went, God, you know, they need breakthrough thinking. Isn't that fascinating? You know, and so whatever your thing is, you're going to see what's there through those glasses. You're going to see the problem in terms of what you know how to fix. That's why, uh, that's why research is so important, because it, 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 it can break your trance and break the trance of the organization. They already have an, everybody already knows what's wrong. They have a story about it. They're rationalizing it, and that's what's keeping it in place. You've got to do research that helps to break the trance. So don't do any action without research. And don't just do research. This is, oh man, I get on this. I could do a whole thing on this. Most organizations have a culture survey now. In 1978, two colleagues and I 
created the first computer scored organization effectiveness survey. Paper tape, that was the technology, it was paper tape. It's called the People Performance Profile. We had no clue how to make a business out of it. Five years later, the thing went belly up, and now everybody has computer scored organizational surveys. I wish we could have found a way to ride that wave, but we blew it. So, people do a survey and a small group, and all the data goes back to somebody. Probably the executive team gets a summary, maybe somebody in HR, a small group of people, maybe the people that developed the survey come and tell you what it means. Ron Lippitt said, oh man, do research and then let the people decide what it means. Oh my God. I, here, I said, give me that data from that survey. Well, we've already done something with it. I know, I know. Just, can we have the data and use it? Oh, okay. And then feed that data back to, the, to each work team. Who cares whether it's a 4.5 or 4.36? What Ron taught me is those numbers are only useful to start a conversation. Now, what are some examples? Okay, that 4.5 between you and marketing, what's that? Man, they never give us that stuff on Friday. Oh, now we're talking about real stuff in real time. See? Who cares about the 2.5? And everybody, everybody in the executive team, oh, how can we raise this score? How can we do this? And, and, and I, Give me the numbers and let us take it to the people. They can do this. So this is a secret weapon if you can just get, just get them to let you have the data. Um, focus on groups, not individuals. Uh, Kurt realized it's easier to change an individual behavior by shifting the norms in a group than it is to take the individual out of the group and change what they do. Groups are the basic unit of change. This has been superseded now. Large group, large group change initiatives, where you get the whole system in the room. But even then, small groups are created around certain, you know what I'm saying? So I think Ron was still, I think Kurt was still right about that. Set attainable targets with the people that are involved. Don't let the executives give people targets. Convince the executives that they're going to do better if you let the people do it. And this is really interesting that when, when a group makes a decision to do something, there's more accountability. People hold their feet to the fire. Those who do the work know what needs to change, and you want to break existing paradigms with the people who need to change. So when you get the slides, Look at your own practice and see what happens there. Force field analysis is a good way to start. So this is my definition of, of action research. Finding out what's actually happening and why with all the stakeholders. Getting that data on the table where it is discussed and interpreted in a safe environment by those involved who have been empowered to act, has the power to change the people, the situation, and the system. So this is the core of my practice for, I don't know, 40 years. So let's do this, because I've been talking a lot. So this is, now this is the last time you'll talk to this person, then, then I'm going to have you switch. Talk about this. I don't care what you talk about, but chew on this. What, what in it is interesting? What do you do? What's a piece that maybe is something you need to stretch more into? I'm interested in that. Which piece of this is, is a challenge that you think you might need to step into? Okay. Five minutes, ready, go. <laughs>
Is this the one you're supposed to be talking about? Is this the one you're supposed to be talking about? 